Welcome, everyone. Um, today's presentation in this session is entitled From Startup to Standout, Founder Stories from the Front Lines. I am Sabrina Schenker, and I'm going to be this session's MC. Um, I'm currently a member of Hostess City Toastmasters and a graduate student at SCAD. Um, today, we are going to spend 30 minutes listening to Susan and Connie talk about their presentation, and then we're going to spend about 20 minutes doing a Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having us. Um, I'm Susan. I'm Connie. Um, so we're just going to be, you know, blabbing about ourselves for the next 30 minutes and, and plan it. Um, but we'd love to first just get a quick poll of the room. How many of you guys have startups or are founders of startups right now? Okay. How many of you guys want to found a startup one day? Okay. How many of you guys just want to work for a startup? Oh, okay. All founders in here. <laughs> awesome. Um, so quick, we're going to kick it off with this quick introduction of what Planted is, who we are, and then go into how uh, Planted all started um, and just dive into the story. So we are a talent community that connects startups and high growth companies with young professionals for non-technical positions. I know that's a mouthful, but essentially it's if you're a business and you're trying to hire for customer support, sales, operations, anything that's non-design, non-dev related, we're the platform to go to for that. Um, and a quick kind of background on me is I started my career in finance, quickly realized that I would hate my life in the next 30 years. Um, and I was actually at Lehman Brothers uh, when in 2008. So that also made me quickly realize that startups aren't so risky. Um, so I left Lehman or Barclays and actually joined an early stage company at the time. Um, I was a 10th employee at Tough Mudder. I'm not sure uh, how many of you guys are familiar with them. They're this crazy kind of like 10 to 12 mile military style obstacle race where people pay a couple hundred dollars to get electrocuted. I don't know. <laughs> um, but we quickly grew from 10 people to about 200 in two years. And so that really gave me a lot of experience with a rapidly scaling company and the ins and outs and the trials and tribulations that every startup faces um, as they scale. Um, and then from there, uh, met with Connie. A quick background, I studied business and school, and then started my career in management consulting at Accenture in New York. We're also from New York and came down here for this weekend, uh, as a side note. I uh, was there for a few years, again, similar to Susan, didn't see myself wanting to be in corporate my you know, entire life, so I transitioned <laughs> to an early stage dating startup. So it was a mobile dating startup before Tinder came about, so early days. And there was leading product and learning about product management, working with engineers, building um, and iterating our products. So that's where I kind of got my first run at working at a startup. We were a 10 person team, uh, pretty lean and um, learned all about that, that side um, before joining up with Susan for Planted. And how Planted started, I mean, I think it's a lot of founder stories. It's really from a personal pain point um, as we experienced a lot of challenges as job seekers as well as hiring managers. From the job seeker side, um, Connie and I actually met at a wedding uh, about, I think it's like six or seven years ago now, and we were uh, just transitioning from corporate to startups, and we really commiserated sitting across the wedding table from each other of how difficult it was to really find a job at an innovative, um, awesome, up-and-coming company, because it's not like banking or consulting where essentially all the, you know, or Google where all the companies come on campus and they recruit you, even if you want to work for a startup, it's really hard to know where to begin, how to find them, and then actually break into them. So, so that was really what we saw as a challenge as job seekers. Um, as a hiring manager at Tough Mudder, one of the things, um, challenges that we faced when we were 10 people, when we were 200 people, it was always hiring for the right people, um, especially at the junior level. I think when you're looking for more experienced folks, you have a lot more data points to point to in terms of, okay, well, this is exactly who, you know, 
the X number of years of coding experience and this is specific language. But when you're looking for someone fresh out of school, it's really hard to know if they're the right fit. So, and that's how um, when we came up with Planted, that's the issue that we really wanted to address to help these two sides really connect with one another um, and be able to find each other uh, much more efficiently and much more quickly. Yeah, so in my end, you know, had a similar hiring pain point just from a different type of organization. So more lean, startup, under-resourced, no dedicated HR. Uh, for those of you who are, you know, in early stage companies, you may also not have an HR process or team yet. And so, you know, if you're trying to hire quickly, you're posting on whatever job board you can find and just getting flooded with resumes back. And so you just have to kind of go through every single one manually and it seemed like a really tedious uh, process that could be made a lot more efficient. And so when we started out, and that was back in 2013, 14, <laughs> um, we really uh, ascribed to the Lean Startup methodology. Um, how many of you guys are familiar? with the methodology or the book or, yeah. And, and the main reason we were, you know, primary adopters of that is because we didn't have any money. <laughs> so um, that was number one. And number two is we really wanted to make sure that whatever we built, whatever we spent our time on was actually something that people wanted. Um, so for us, we thought it would be really helpful to go through the methodology and kind of like how our story applied to that. Because I remember when I was first starting out and I was reading all about this theory and you know the theoreticals and hypotheticals, I was like, that all sounds great, but in practicality, how do you actually apply that to building a business? Um, so the number one tenant, and um, the first tenant in uh, Lean Startup is really validate, really first pinpoint what your riskiest assumptions are about the business and then the next step would be to validate them. So the risky assumptions for us about Planted was we experienced the pain points of hiring for junior non-technical folks, but did every other company, did other hiring managers. So that was number one. And then two, if they did, would they be willing to be, would they be willing to pay for help with finding these kinds of people, given there are so many other things that they're worried about and that they could spend their budget on. So those are the two top two questions um, that we really wanted to make sure that we got to the bottom of before we started building anything. Then, if, for those of you who are familiar, um, the next uh, thing to go to is, well, what's the MVP needed, minimum viable product needed to validate your assumptions? And, um, minim minimum MVP, for those of you who aren't too familiar, is the smallest unit of product um, that you need in order to make sure that your assumption is either true or false. Again, that sounds like a lot of theory. What does that mean for Planted? <laughs> we essentially built a WordPress landing page, and by built, it's very loose. Like We took a template, a free template, <laughs> slapped on an image onto it um, that companies and candidates could really sign up. Um, they signed up, they thought we were a real website, we were a real business. On the back end, we were scurrying around using Google spreadsheets, matching up candidates and companies completely manually. There was no technology involved, really. Um, but that's all we needed to get started um, in figuring out if Planted was actually a viable business to begin with. And then the third one, once you have your MVP built, is get out there and actually talk to customers um, and validate whether or not this is truly a pain point, whether or not your MVP does work for them. And, and you'll even, you know, like, uh, I think uh, the saying is, if the first product you ship, you're not embarrassed by, you've spent way too much work on it. <laughs> um, so for us, after we built the WordPress landing page, we booked an office hours at a co-working space. And mind you, we don't have anything at this point. I think we had uh, maybe like 10 candidates and those were friends and little brothers and sisters of our friends that had just graduated from college and was like, I really need a job. And we're like, we can help you, give us your resume. <laughs> so we brought our paper resumes of candidates, of these candidates to office hours, which was actually sold out. All we did was market 
through like a one page flyer that, hey, do you need help hiring <laughs> for entry level folks? Come to the office hours and we'll show you how. And that day, we signed our first customer. We actually presented them with uh, the resumes of the candidates and said, it was a very kind of like uh, real life Tinder. It's like swipe left on this resume or swipe right. Swipe left or swipe right on the second resume. Oh, don't worry, you like the second one? We'll get more of those for you <laughs> once you sign on. Um, but that was really validating for us that without having anything built on the back end, um, that companies were felt the pain point was compelling enough that they would spend their time talking to us. And then two, they would actually sign on and potentially part with dollars for something that we promised to sell. <laughs> Um, so that was kind of one of the final steps in us really getting to um, the first step of the MVP. And in reality, um, on that WordPress landing page, we actually made $75,000 without a single line of code. Cool. So we got our first match, made the first dollar, We're like woo. That first invoice you make, by the way, is, is awesome. Um, I think it's still framed on our wall somewhere. And then we're like, oh, maybe that was a fluke. Let's try to replicate this. Let's do it 10 times, and then we'll, we'll talk about if we have a business. Um, so we did it 10 times, and these are people that we didn't know, so they weren't our friends or anything like that. No you know, um, bias there. Um, even our friends wouldn't pay us, though, if it wasn't valuable, so that was a good test. And from there, we're like, hey, you know, we've done this 10 times. We now have 10 different customer uh, feedback points. Uh, what have we learned across the 10? What is similar? What's different? Uh, sounds like we have kind of a working business model here. And so at that point, you know, it was just the two of us at the time, also both non-technical uh, backgrounds. And we knew that we needed, you know, support around us. And we also needed to build, to round out our team. So for those of you who might be on the non-technical background side looking for a technical co-founder, you know, this is when we actually went out and, and basically recruited a, uh, one of our friends to be our technical co-founder. And it wasn't an easy process. Um, you know, it's, unless you have someone that you went to school with that you know and, and everything um, and trust already, it's really hard to, see, to find someone who wants to help you build your, your idea. But I think we were successful because we actually had real data points. We said, hey, we have a business. We have an, not just an idea, we have a validated idea, and we've made real money off of it. And that was what um, you know, ultimately got our technical co-founder to join our team. And so with that you know, full skill set between sales that Susan focuses on, product, myself, and our tech um, co-founder, we were able to then look at um, some accelerator programs as options to help us launch our startup. Uh, so who knows what an accelerator is? Couple hands, okay. So an accelerator program is, you know, there's a lot of them out there, is generally around a three, four month program that takes in early stage companies and gives you a ton of resources. Mentorship, investor connections, uh, business development connections, all in a very compressed accelerated time frame. Um, and it kind of ends and culminates in a demo day where you are pitching your refined pitch to now hundreds, hopefully hundreds of investors um, to kind of showcase your company, get PR, and also ultimately raise your first or you know, early round. Uh, so as first time founders, we found this to be really, really you know, valuable of an opportunity because we didn't have you know, a network already that we could you know, fall back on. We wanted some more advice from people. Of, you know, I was in a business fraternity in school. It kind of felt like that in a way, but for adults, um, <laughs> sort of adult version of a fraternity. Uh, where it's really compressed, it's really crazy, but at the end you get you know really lifelong connections out of it and a ton of resources. So we can go over more uh, accelerator stuff later on as well if you guys have more questions on that. But for us, you know, we went through the TechStars New York program. Uh, speaking on them specifically, they have programs all over the world. Uh, they even have ones that are. Uh, industry specific, so if you're looking to get into retail or something like that, they partner with different corporate brands that can get you those types of connections. We went through the general program in New York. There were about 
11, 12 other companies in our batch. And so it was very much a hands-on model. And you know, we sat in a dedicated co-working space every day from like 9 a.m. to midnight and <laughs> worked on our startup day in and day out. Um, and after that, you know, we had a really strong demo day and we were able to uh, basically close our first round um, very quickly after that. And I think we, you know, attribute a lot of that um, speed of being able to close that round to the accelerator program, being able to introduce us to a ton of investors all at once, create momentum and create a sense of urgency to close that round, which is sometimes the hardest thing to do if you're trying to raise money. So from there, that's, you know, we're like, hey, now we've got some, some seed money to actually build out this team, build out this product, really test um, and bring our beta WordPress um, an initial website from uh, beta into real launch. Um, so we brought on um, a, a bigger team, including Kevin right here in the front. <laughs> He's built a lot of our stuff. And we actually launched a new brand, um, Planted, as you see now. We were actually a different name originally. We were Linksy, so spelled L-Y-N-X-Y, S-Y, I can't spell it. Um, so it was a long time ago. <laughs> Hence, we changed our name so that more people could find it and spell it. So if you are thinking about a new name for your startup, just please go to a bar and ask 10 people if they can spell it and you know, read your name before you lock it in and it just haunts you for the rest of your, your startup career. <laughs> so we launched a new brand um, and we built the first version of our site and uh, built out a team uh, to about 10 people as well across all different functions. and. Uh, kind of grew from that, that program. So from those early days of a WordPress landing page and some spreadsheets, we then started automating a lot of the, the processes and things that we had validated. And that's kind of been our approach all along is validate first you know, with an MVP and that MVP might be a spreadsheet, it might be a piece of paper, might be really you know, quick code out the door. Uh, but then once you do that, then actually automate. Otherwise, you might be building the wrong thing. And over time, as we've gotten more refined about our process and more sophisticated in our, in our product, you know, we've built a ton of things. We've built, um, a, we basically have three users that we're building for in our product. The companies on one end who are recruiting, candidates on the other end who are job seeking, as well as a big admin portal and tool set for our own internal team. So we have a lot to build and a lot to prioritize. Um, for each one, you know, we go through a process of defining a business case for each feature. You know, why should we be building this? You know, based on feedback we've heard, based on data that we're looking at, each feature needs to have a very specific reason because you don't have a lot of time and you need to prioritize that time. For each feature, we also um, define kind of a hypothesis, like what do we think the impact will be from this feature? And that's something you just need to be very disciplined about from you know, those early days, no resources, bootstrap, testing your MVP, up to building that next you know, additional feature on your platform. So we define what hypothesis that is, and then we measure it. So we, are, we spend probably an equal amount of time measuring as we do building as well, because if you don't have any data on it, then you have no idea how, what the impact was ultimately. Um, and then also in addition to that quantitative data, you want to make sure you get qualitative data as well from your users, you know, making sure you still remember to go back to your users, ask them, hey, we launched this new stuff. What do you think? Um, where could it be improved or do you just hate it? You know, uh, and just keep iterating from there. So it's sort of this build, measure, iterate feedback loop that you constantly apply to features big and small but you want to keep doing throughout your, your cycle. So the, the mentality we had in the beginning is something we still maintain today and as we continue to launch and, and build out the platform. So where we are today, we have over now 2,000 2, brands uh, ranging from early stage startups up to um, fast growing startups like Casper and Rent the Runway to um, even bigger names like Hearst Media, Constant Contact, uh, really validating up and down the spectrum that a lot of companies have this challenge bringing on, hiring uh, in an efficient manner, so junior non-technical talent. 
and we've grown our network to over 85,000 candidates in our in our community. So, you know, we feel like we're in a really strong place now where we've we've really validated early assumptions. Um, where we are is primarily in New York, um, but we're looking to other markets uh, to expand to those other markets, you know, in the near future. So that's kind of a little bit about um, where we are today. Yeah. So I guess that's, that's a quick backstory to us. I know we talked on a lot of different topics, but we'd like to have you guys guide the conversation to what you guys want to know. Yeah. Have you had any assumptions that were not validated that were failures? And when do you know when to pull the plug on stuff like that? Good question. <laughs> um, definitely. I mean, I think, um, you know, which one? Uh, early on, I think, you know, we really wanted to um, kind of test that. Well, we, we actually were testing um, temporary help early in the days um, in terms of, hey, we can create this new structure for um, kind of a temporary engagement for people and giving them additional um, support for admin or customer support work. Um, we found that, um, you know, we thought that we could kind of more easily break into certain industries and felt like we found a, a better sweet spot somewhere else. So that was sort of a lot of customer discovery and, and feedback and figuring out where was this value prop most applicable to in their customer set. Um, and I would say that's like a kind of like a big business um, hypothesis, but when it comes to features and product and process, we're constantly um, you know, testing hypotheses that don't work. So for example, really specifically, when we first started out in building uh, interview scheduling between companies and candidates, we're like, okay, well, you know, as um, we would think that they would want to make it as structured and as easy as possible. So the company would just offer a couple of time slots to the candidate and the candidate would confirm on which one they're avail available for. Sounds pretty easy, straightforward, right? But then we found that the adoption of this feature was super low. And the reason for that is because so many companies have different interview processes. Um, some of them are using third-party um, applicant tracking systems. Other companies want to rope in additional hiring managers. Other people want their admins to schedule. And so we had to evolve that feature to be able to be flexible enough to accommodate all the use cases and make it much more open-ended. Um, but that, so to that question, it's like we're constantly um, like, a ton of assumptions and hypotheses uh, get tested, thrown out, and then, but that just means the next version of it is so much better. Do you, do you find any big problems with the new startup role that you've grown from you? Uh, um, any big problems? You mean like clarifying on that well, question? Well, process that they recommend? Yeah, I mean, no process is perfect. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, you have to go with your gut uh, because you don't have all the data in the world and you just have to make a decision. I think the Lean Startup is just the framework. That's a really good way to follow where, um, uh, you know, you, we are constant, for a startup, um, you're always in an ambiguous situation. You never know what's the right next step. Um, so that really keeps you grounded in the data, so making sure that you're capturing, you're able to capture and measure, um, and then use that data to loop back into your process or product to make it better. So just keeping that in the back of your head. But of course, yeah, like a lot of times, we have to make gut decisions about what we think, and that data might not tell us, and, and sometimes we're right or not, but um, overall, we think it's like a great framework just to follow, especially when you don't have millions of VC funding to toss at the wall. A few questions. So as founders, people tend to be very hands-on. As you grew, did you struggle with uh, delegating and trusting? And then the second question is, you're from New York, how'd you end up here? <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> second question is Kevin. Uh, and he is our CTO, by the way. Um, uh, first question, I think that's always a first, like a founder kind of challenge that you have to figure out. How do I let go? <laughs> and that's really hard. I think 
you know, in the early days we were making all the matches A to Z. So everything from finding the customer to um, onboarding them to then kind of getting it up and running in our system and then out to our candidate network and kind of following that process all the way in. Um, over time, we did hire, and we, we have a team now that kind of, where we are a little bit more hands off, but it certainly wasn't an easy let go. <laughs> um, and I think that's something that you kind of have to challenge yourself with constantly, like, you know, you are the founder, like you should be focusing on things that are scaling uh, the company that are gonna create step changes. And if you're not, then why not? And how can you solve that problem? So it's just something you gotta continuously question. Thank you. What would you say was the hardest lesson that you so far. God, I feel like we're still learning. <laughs> That's why I said so far. So far. Um, I think in the beginning we had, um, when we first started Planted, um, we were talking with another friend of ours, another fellow founder who had been working on his business. He was a little bit maybe like four or five years ahead. Um, and we asked him the same question. <laughs> what do you wish you knew? <laughs> Um, at the beginning, and, and out of everything that he said, he was like, the number one thing um, was managing my own psychology as a founder. Um, there's, it's a roller coaster ride. Startups are so up, so down. The ups and downs are much higher and lower <laughs> than, than working for, for a company, uh, for another company. And so at the end of the day, it's being able to manage your own, um, your own mindset about how you look at things, not getting demoralized, um, see being able to see things from an objective perspective um, so that you can keep going. Um, at Techstars, they always taught us that startups, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and so always keeping that in, in, in the back of your mind really helps uh, with all the day-to-day -day challenges that come. And I'll just add on to that. I think with that, it's so valuable to have a co-founder. Uh, you know, I know. Um, I could, we can, I couldn't personally imagine this doing it on my own or just like, it would just be so much harder because you don't have anyone else that you, that can truly see where you are and uh, un understand, you know, your position in the company. Um, so definitely, uh, the two of us, we talk all the time if there's ups or downs, like there's someone else there. And so that's, you know, I would always recommend to try to find a co-founder if you can, when you start something. Sorry, question. Uh and maybe I didn't hear, when you guys started this, did you guys quit your job or were you still doing a day job? And two, did you have a, uh, a safety net that, hey, this didn't work or, you know, I can continue to provide myself during full time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was definitely a big consideration. Um, at the time, uh, Susan had already left her job. I was about to leave mine and going through that exact, pro you know, thinking process in my head. Um, you know, the way we thought about it was at the time that we started a few years ago, we were like, hey, if we want to have a shot at this, um, this is the time. And here's my kind of worst case scenario. You know, we gave ourselves a timeline and said, okay, well, let's give ourselves a year. You know, we have a little bit enough savings to kind of figure this out. And, um, you know, worst case scenario, we learn a ton. We come away with this with a lot of great growth opportunity. And then we go and find another job. <laughs> so, you know, I. I that was sort of our, how do we reason that, that worst case scenario? And then as we made that decision, it was like, let's take the plunge, then it's just, just, just focusing on the next uh, uphill battle, the next obstacle, overcoming it, and then moving to the next milestone. So it was like, okay, can we get anybody to you know, say yes to us as being a customer? Can we get 10? Can we get 20? Can we, get through this accelerator program, you know, can we um, bring on new team members? And so as you go down the path and keep, you know, hitting each milestone, your confidence level builds up and up um, until kind of you, you know, reach new stages. And so that's kind of how you pick it apart. <laughs> um, and I would also add to that, yeah, like, um, I think a lot of people when thinking about starting a startup or, you know, a new business, there's a lot of um, fear. There's a lot of fear of risk, of failure. Um, one thing that really helped me was working at a bank that, you know, died after 100 years. I was like, oh, a startup is, doesn't feel so risky and at least you're in control of your own destiny <laughs> and making the decisions. Um, 
but yeah, I think similar to what Connie said, it's really thinking about objectively, thinking about your own personal runway, um, your savings, how long that will take you, um, what you need to sacrifice in the interim, potentially. You can't have it all. <laughs> so can't can't keep going out to, to eat out every night, um, but, you know, and also fund your own business without any um, additional income coming in. And then thinking through your milestones, like what, and going back to the framework of the Lean Startup, it's, it's like, what are your personal milestones of what you would, um, that you would consider to be on the track to success or the next milestone? Or maybe you're off of that track, so you need to reevaluate the business, what you're doing, the process, um, and your personal situation, too. Um, and there's no, I don't think there's any, um, uh, there's no shame in that at all. That's what a startup is all about. It's constant re-evaluation and tuning to the new data that you get. Um, and and it's, as part of uh, living your life as an entrepreneur, um, as much as building an actual startup. Online marketplaces often have this chicken before the egg issue where if there aren't people on the totally. other side, the others on the other side are <laughs> Yeah, no, that is a really good point. If I known, if I knew then what I know now about online marketplaces. <laughs> um, so for us, um, when we started this a couple of years ago, um, we focused specifically on uh, recent grads or junior non-technical because what we saw was a really underserved market. Um, you know, they're. Still today, there's a lot of solutions out there for experienced folks. There's a lot of solutions out there for tech folks, even. Um, back then, 53% of recent grads under the age of 25 were either unemployed or underemployed. And so that really helped build the momentum for the supply side of candidates. Um, and I think um, once you kind of have a little bit of that, and it's a little bit of a competitive advantage in the market, um, and I think that always helps in greasing the wheels and either building supply or demand. Um, after that, it's just a matter of uh, uh, kind of like figuring out what the right ratio, the right liquidity is between candidates and companies. And, and we go back and forth. Every quarter, we're like, oh, okay, we gotta focus on job seekers again, gotta focus on their tools, gotta focus on you know um, getting more on the platform. And then the next quarter, we're like, well, we gotta get more companies, we gotta build more tools for them um, and, and create more stickiness. Um, so there's no right answer to that um, uh, at the end of the day. Um, but I think one thing to think about building your online marketplace uh, depends on the industry that you're in um, and thinking about if supply leads demand or demand leads supply. Um, and there's usually one that's uh, easier, uh, that affects the other uh, much more greatly. And I would recommend starting with that side of the business. Uh, specific challenges, great product by the way. Um, specific challenges in the sales process. Um, you know, trying to convince companies to use you guys. Can you speak to anything about that? Yeah, you know, in our market, so this is actually going on the last, um, the answer to the last question is, what we've really realized over time is actually candidates drive companies. Um, so, not saying that sales for us is easy <laughs> by any means, but what we found is we, if we have a consistent pipeline of quality candidates, then, um, you know, talking to companies and convincing them that um, one, they know that they have a problem hiring uh, for that type of position, and then it's you know they're just wasting spending a lot of time doing it. Um, we found that to be really compelling, and that's really helped us build to over 2,000 companies on the platform. Um, and then I would say, uh, in addition to top line growth of sales, um, that's important. But for us, what was really important was retention, because you can get you know a ton of companies sign up because they know it's a problem, but if you can't actually make them happy, they're just going to churn out. So for us, measuring retention of the companies after they used us is one of, of our core KPIs on the demand side. Um, to date, we have an 80% company retention rate, which shows what we're building, um, the services that we're providing, is really adding value. And the vast majority of companies that sign up 
are through word of mouth and referral. And that's the best kind because it's free. <laughs> to, to dovetail into the, into the sales question here, how did you see your pitch evolve over time? Yeah, that, that's also interesting. You know, like I would say it hasn't changed that much in terms of the pitch. We, and I think that speaks to the core market that we we're going after. Um, we're definitely looking to expand now with the learnings that we have, but our core market today have been innovative, forward-looking companies. Um, and we spoke to them as if we were the customer. I mean, like when I was working at Tough Mudder, like as if, if someone's pitching me, what would resonate? Um, so for us, um, speaking to tech companies, you know, short on resources and money. Um, so how can they get the best folks in the seat fastest? Uh, that's always resonated. But we obviously know as we expand to different industries, different types of companies, to um, really listen to the feedback that the company's giving us, whether that's explicit or implicit, and tweaking our messaging so that we're speaking directly to their pain point. I guess I would add to that just, I think what some things that have evolved and changed is learning about the different you know, specific features or things that we need to add to our platform to accommodate different types of users. Um, especially in recruitment, there's a lot of different tools that they could be using and being able to integrate into their workflow for larger customers and, and thinking about you know, their types of pricing for volume, volume hiring, that kind of thing was, were, were things that evolved, but the core pitch kind of remained the same. I had one back there. Um, other than the generic answer, because it's just easier, what was the tipping point? What was the reason? Because it sounded like you guys were doing good when you were uh, bootstrapping it yourself. So why give up equity for funding? Uh, why give up equity? What was that tipping point? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, um, the trade-off is to grow faster. Um, we, we were doing well um, when we were bootstrapping, but there was a ceiling. You know, we were doing everything ourselves. And so that meant that there was only so much that we could do. Um, and in order to be able to scale the business, grow to more companies and grow to more candidates, um, you know, you need to incentivize people <laughs> to uh, investors to give you money um, in exchange for uh, growing your team. Um, and that's really where the vast majority of the funding that we've received has gotten into, an investment into growing our team. How did you determine your price first off, and did it fluctuate over time? Yeah. Uh, yeah, how we determined our price was a really scientific. <laughs> uh, <laughs> honestly, um, it was looking at alternatives in the market, seeing where they were priced at, what services we were offering that was different from theirs um, that we could sell, and just naming the highest highest uh, price that you can without blinking <laughs> and seeing what the feedback is <laughs> and then you adjust from there. It's a constant iteration. Um, for, my, for us, the pricing has changed slightly even though um, the structure has it and that's just been in response to companies' feedback for, for us um, and um, as we scaled from like uh, one, a company hiring one person from us to hiring 10, 20, 30, then the pricing also changes because you need to be able to accommodate their budget, um, but it's worth it because you're, you're gaining larger um, companies and you're helping more candidates get jobs at those companies. When you were growing from having the 10 people to the 80,000 um, like students coming out of college kind of thing, how did you market to those customers? Like, What did you find the best marketing? I mean, I think you know, the biggest value prop we've, we've found for candidates is, hey, grow your career. Find a, not just a job, but something that you actually are really passionate about. And that's really what drew us individually to startups too, and away from corporate was, you know, we wanted to have impact. We wanted to know how our work drove the bottom line. And so that's the message that we found resonated with a lot of other candidates and, and um, students, you know, looking for their first job even. How do I, um, actually find a job that's meaningful to me. And so that's largely been a lot of our, our, our outward you know, um, marketing, uh, positioning and everything. Um, 
and you know we do a lot of events like this because we find that education and content is a huge um, um, way that people find us organically um, and we, we put a lot of resources into building you know and positioning ourselves not just as a job board traditionally but as actually as a career platform so we can help people all along the spectrum whether that be you know revising your resume to you know um, interview tips to kind of even thinking about what roles exist at startups and where you might fit in. So we really invested a lot there. Are you eyeballing uh, acquirers or uh, partner companies to grow with? You think like uh, uh, eBay was ultimately a merger of two competing companies. Are you eyeballing things like that? Or just focus on your customers and growing? I mean, we're definitely focused on growing, but growing with partners that make sense as well. So we actually have partnered with a lot of universities, with other startup-focused organizations and, and um, other companies that are focused on growing the tech community in New York um, because either they you know, could brand our name you know, amongst other companies or help um, other candidates kind of come into our door. So it's definitely, if you can find partners that make sense for your industry, definitely invest in them, but know that they do take a long time in terms of payback, but ultimately it's kind of building brand value at large and, and also kind of, you know, building that up. But that's, that's our core focus. <laughs> I was just wondering, when does that startup feeling Well, I can speak to today. I feel like, yeah, we're still in startup mode. <laughs> um, and that means that just means like there's after every milestone that you cross off your list, there's an even bigger milestone and an even bigger hill to climb. But um, that's that's the exciting part of a startup that it doesn't feel like uh, it stagnates or you, you start to plateau. Um, but we'll definitely let you know when we stop feeling like a startup. <laughs> Go about determining what exactly the MVP is for your company and like how to work with that. I mean, yeah, at the beginning stages, you mean? Yeah. Um, again, like Susan mentioned, it's about uh, defining what your assumptions are, you know, and then thinking about what it is that you need to use to test those assumptions. So, um, I remember early on when I was still in consulting, looking from you know the outside in into startup world, trying to get my head around it. I went to really um, insightful kind of startup, lean startup weekend, um, where they actually taught you in practice how to go from idea to validated concept over a weekend. Um, so you kind of got together on a Friday night, everyone pitched ideas, you voted for the best ones, and then you got together with cross-functional teams. I'd never worked with a developer or designer before, and that was really cool, um, to then think about what is an MVP for this particular idea. And you only had 24 hours to build it, right? So that could be, you know, vaporware landing page with nothing on the back end, see if anybody clicks through, right, and clicks buy. <laughs> or it could be um, a survey, you know, that you build on Google Form for free. And you're asking, you know, do you have a pain point with this, yes or no? To, I know some people just went out the building and surveyed people on the street to see if they could get some feedback on it or go to a Starbucks. So. It can really be all forms and it doesn't have to be code. Um, I think that's the most important part is that you need to figure out what at the root is the question that you need to ask to validate the assumption. Okay, when you're out there and you're talking with people about your idea, do you ever have the fear that if I talk too much about it, somebody else is going to take my idea and run with it? I mean, how do you talk about it without feeling like you're giving away yeah, um, that's definitely you know, something we thought about at the beginning, but I think you quickly realize that um, ideas are a little bit a dime a dozen. Um, if you have a good idea, probably someone else had that really great idea 30 years ago or 10 years ago or yesterday, but it's all about the execution. Um, so my personal recommendation is like, talk to as many people as you can about your idea because you're gonna get feedback that way. You're gonna hear what, um, what questions 
other people ask to poke holes in your ideas, and so you can think more critically about um, the answers to those uh, to those questions and to build um, a much uh, better business than you would have before. I think um, some entrepreneurs fall into the trap of building a product or building a business in a vacuum, and then at the end of the day, what they realize is that they've spent a year building this amazing, beautiful product that nobody really, um, like actually there's not a problem that it's actually solving. Um, and so I've definitely heard about uh, stories like that before. So I think we also have another speaker today. <laughs> so we're gonna pass on, save you guys from us, and pass on the mic to him. <laughs> Um, well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jared Jester, and I am founder and uh, CEO, former founder and CEO of Jester Communications. Um, my company uh, was founded uh, straight out of the Savannah College of Art and Design. I went to SCAD, graduated in 2000. I started my company the week following graduation. Um, the company was founded on mobile application development. Um, uh, Initially on the iPhone, essentially where we got, you know, our big start. Uh, we specialize in mobile sales support systems for global dealer networks. For global dealer networks are some of the largest manufacturers in the world. Uh, we won worldwide acclaim for the design and functionality of our mobile applications. Uh, we built a strong vertical in the marine industry initially. Then we branched out to engines, heavy equipment, nuclear industries as well. Um, we always pride ourselves in master craftsmen, the mobile user interface, and design. Design was always paramount to me because, to me, you know, all things are relative and people base their opinions on how things look. Um, a little bit about uh, the company. I did earn a BFA from graphic design from SCAD uh, and then founded the company as stated earlier. Um, our collective goal of the company was to create as many recurring revenue possibilities as we could using our proprietary software platform took about seven years to build over time. I mean, the mobile platform back in uh, 08, when we launched the world's first iPhone application for the marine industry, no one really wanted to mess with the phone. And the things that were told to me is, you know, who would use a mobile phone for business? And we think it's cool, but no one's ever gonna mess with this. So it was disheartening. So back to website development, which is really what we started doing in the very beginning. Um, developed some more websites. The iPad came out a few years later, a few years later. Um, did the same thing. We went to Beneteau, the world's largest cell boat manufacturer, and told them that I think I can help you sell more boats if you use this technology that we'll build for you. Um, if you uh, like it, you can pay it for us or pay us for it. Um, otherwise, we'll build it for free and then we'll use it to market our product. Um, that application itself, um, we won the highest accolade in the world in the marine industry when it was launched. And so the Miami Boat Show back in 2010 uh, was really our first award that we ever applied for in the first one we won and that kind of catapult us um, moving forward. So kind of a little timeline here, I know you guys can't see it. Uh, the company was founded in 2000, built websites until probably about 06, 07 when the mobile app started, uh, the mobile phone came out for the iPhone. Um, we built the world's first iPhone app for the marine space. Um, 2011, uh, iPad came out, or 2010 therefore, um, captured uh, Beneteau was our first client, and then we went on to capture seven out of ten of the world's largest uh, boat manufacturers in the world uh, that year as clients. Um, 2012, we started to branch out and realize that we may have a product um, because we were doing all this in the middle of a recession in a uh, disposable income item industry. And ultimately, going our success, we started to go into engines um, as well as heavy equipment, power equipment, uh, motorcycles, motorsports, and then started working in the nuclear realm, so building applications for nuclear power plants. Some of the st stages of our learning, uh, when I first started the business, I really didn't know a lot about business because at that time they taught very little at art school. And so ultimately, you know, I just knew that make things pretty um, and ultimately try to generate revenue uh, to sustain ourselves. Um, develop client relationships. Um, business development was paramount because we were bootstrapped and I never took any money from anybody. 
the whole time. Um, the next phase, second phase, was between 2008 and 2014. Uh, we had large corporate clientele. We had uh, large scale projects. So we were building massive B2B systems at this point for some of these large OEMs and starting to garner some notoriety on a global level for some of the stuff that we had accomplished. Um, app development was our focus. We dropped website development and focused purely on mobile application development for iOS only at that point. Um, iOS to me was, and still is, the superior platform. That's just my personal opinion. Um, but at the time, it was, uh, it was extremely daunting to develop for Android, and so we chose not to do so. Um, but the two words that I learned to use back to back in a sentence in about 2013 was recurring revenue. And what I learned is that recurring revenue gives you a piece of money each and every month. It allows you not only to sustain yourself, but to grow your company and eventually to potentially make some money. So 2015 to 2017, we productized our offerings. Uh, we built strategic relationships, um, really focused on my business acumen and how to basically court investors. At this point, I know I wanted to sell the company. And so I started figuring out ways in which to do that. And then focusing on our strengths and efforts. So essentially, we had three products. Uh, one was Bolster, it still is active. Toucan was another one and then FME, which stands for Foreign Material Exclusion. Uh, this is for the nuclear industry, for the marine, power sports heavy equipment industry, and then Toucan is for uh, dealer networks. Um, Bolster is the main product. It's a comprehensive suite of mobile technologies that enhance and simplify the communication and sell of product lines. Sales support, dealer training, product showcase, product knowledge, inventory, configuration, lead generation, and point of purchase are the things that it does. Now we're starting to do telematics, now we're starting to accumulate information between an engine uh, and a cell phone, keep that information, push it back to the OEM, and then associate this content and this data with that VIN number, with that whole ID, or with the serial number, which is a boat, a car, a motorcycle. Our goal now is to build recurring revenue streams that transcend ownership. So essentially, our recurring revenue streams now are four, five, six, seven years in the making. Um, our distribution, we're in 73 countries, uh, 13 different languages, and there's about a half a million people that are subscribed users to our software at this point. Um, the industries that we're in, marine, engine, wreck vehicles, heavy equipment, farm and ag, submarine, electronics, um, and motorcycles. I know you guys can't see, um, this is just a handful of our clients. These are some of the largest manufacturers in the world um, that are using our software now to fundamentally alter the way that they've done business for tens, twenties, uh, or hundreds of years. So, no more clipboard, no more pen and paper. It's all on your phone, your tablet. Everything's kept up with. Um, manufacturers are no longer printing brochures in certain circumstances. They're not printing pig docs, which are product information guides. And they're not printing product knowledge handbooks, which saves them hundreds of thousands of dollars, which makes it much easier for us to ask for hundreds of thousands of dollars for development. <laughs> um, iPad, iPhone were the first ones, um, begrudgingly uh, went over to Android and because it's of all about the distribution and the more distribution you have, the more <coughs> recurring revenue that's generated. So um, now we're doing Android, have been for several years. We're also building applications for TVOS now, so dealerships around the world have a TV Apple TV and uh, in their dealership, and we created essentially what's a dealer channel. Lets the manufacturer push content directly to these dealerships. So now it's being used for dealer training and dealer certification. Um, for example, uh, Mercury Engines, which are they are the world's largest marine engine manufacturer. They're launching a whole new series of engines in Miami, and uh, two weeks the Miami Boat Show. There's only one way that you can train to uh, to be certified to sell these products and that's through the app. There's no other way to do it. And so they've got 7,620 something dealers globally in about 50 something countries. So um, that makes our software mandatory, which is fantastic for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also doing touch panel and kiosk displays now that we are doing Android application development. Um, and so now we're doing custom wrapped um, touch panel displays. There'll be a couple in Miami Boat Show, launching new software applications that we built for Evinrude, uh, for Suzuki, and also for Chris Craft Corporation. Um, so they'll be launched in just a couple of weeks at the world's largest boat show uh, to showcase their new products. 
I know you guys can't really see it. This is just kind of a little a walkthrough of what it is that one of our applications does. Essentially, it, it has every piece of information about every product that they have um, consolidated into one comprehensive application that's available offline. All the content can be controlled by the manufacturer and pushed to different people based on their geographic location, based on their inventory, based on what they are selling, based on pricing. Um, and so you can control the content, the distribution, and then you can break it or shut it down if it goes into the wrong hands collectively. Um, here's an example of leisure travel vans. They make, in my opinion, the world's finest uh, B plus RV. Um, leisure um, is engaged in a new product that we're now currently working on where when you buy an RV, you get a backpack full of all these brochures because there's a sink, um, you know, a hot water heater, an air conditioning unit, um, refrigerator, everything is its own little product that has warranty information, a brochure, um, and all the content associated with that in a backpack. Well, we've convinced Leisure to put all this information on a device, associate that device to the VIN number of that uh, vehicle. And so whenever you purchase the vehicle, you get a customized iPad that's got all the information about your product on here. And then that's what you utilize to keep up with your records, your maintenance, um, what's happening with your vehicle, communicate with other RV users. And ultimately the goal with this is to associate the hardware and the software, if you will, to that device or to the unit. So when it's time to get another RV, um, the person who's buying it needs to subscribe as well because if they don't, they lose all that information. So to transcend ownership has always been the big thing that I've been trying to get towards all these years. Um, and now it looks as though we're going to do it. So with each unit that comes off their line, which they make about 900 a year, um, every one of them gets an iPad with the software with a paid subscription that's automatically bundled with the price of the unit year two, they have to start paying for it out of pocket. Um, another product is called FME, and it stands for Foreign Material Exclusion. Really, it's just a, uh, it's an accountability tool. It was developed for Duke Energy for a need that they had to basically keep um, sensitive areas free of clutter and content uh, that's not needed. So, for example, if you go into a nuclear power plant, um, you go in there with a tool belt, everything that you carry in there has to be accounted for. Or if you leave behind a screwdriver, or a hammer, um, someone comes behind you, kicks it, it goes into a centrifuge, it could cause a catastrophic event, uh, but more importantly, it's gonna shut the plant down, which is a million bucks a day, is what they generate in revenue. So this uh, accountability tool was initially adopted by Duke Energy. We've now signed uh, Alabama Power, Southern Company, um, Exelon Energy Corporation, which is the largest energy producer in the continental US, and then Duke Energy as well. Um, this application prevents loss. Um, it also generates recurring revenue. The model on this one, they pay per plant per year. So there's a setup fee for our software, um, and then we charge per user per year. And then we let the manufacturer or the nuclear plant or whomever determine how they want to charge the people who are actually paying for it. Sometimes they offset the cost by paying for it themselves. Sometimes they ping their co-op account. Um, sometimes they mark it up and generate a revenue stream all together to make more money for themselves. Um, ultimately, what I've learned over the, the years is there's no substitution for hard work, communication, and learning from others. Um, these items have paved the road for my company to succeed and have established a solid foundation for all involved in operation to strive for. Now, there were times in the process where sustainability seemed dauntingly unachievable, and it would have been easy to cut my losses and move on to another opportunity. However, perseverance Consistently going to the next opportunity and patience, albeit the most difficult virtue, was paramount to the success of my company. Um, effective April of last year, I sold my company Lock, Stock and Barrel, um, and now I'm moving on to my next profession, which I'm going to be a peanut farmer. Does anybody have any questions about a bootstrap company that took no money um, and learned the hard way in every single facet of business to get to the point where I could sell it? Yes, sir. So were you, um, I guess I was a little bit confused on the actual product because I'm maybe doing more than one. So are you actually like delivering custom apps or do you have a pre-built software that you're selling subscription to? So we built the platform. Originally it was custom applications. But after we built about 20 of them, we recognized that we had a product 
um, during the recession. So coming out of the recession, we productized our offering and then called it Bolster. And so Bolster, now that it's a product, um, you know, it's much easier. What we were building is a bunch of instances of semi-custom software, but then when it was time to update the content and the information, then you had 20 instances of a different thing you had to update. So, I mean, they, they were all similar enough that you could just make a platform? Well, we had to go back and refactor and, and take the clients over to the new platform. So that was a huge hit at that point in time. And any money that I had made really went back into paying at this point, 26 people, um, salaries for about a year um, without generating any revenue. I couldn't generate any more business because we had to take care of what we currently have. So that was a tough lesson to learn, um, you know, and, and ultimately with a little bit more foresight, you know, and, and what you said earlier about partner, I mean, absolutely, I wish that I would have had a partner the whole time, truly. Um, there was no one to really bounce ideas off of, and it was my decision, which was fine, you know, but ultimately, I'm not always right. Um, and oftentimes, you know, decisions are not the right ones, and there was really no one to guide me or to say, you know, that's not good, Jared, because ultimately, you know, my employees would, they thought they were supposed to say yes, I suppose. Yeah, Jared, I have the fortune of being on the same side of the water as you, of the South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I've known you a long time. Yeah, this is a <laughs> but I think that's to your credit and why you are successful. You're, you remain humble the whole time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now it's just a different ballgame for me. I mean, I'm still doing business development for the company that acquired mine. Um, and, and that really, uh, I thought the design was my strength and innovation and concepts. But I think that really the business development piece is what I enjoy the most. And so now having an army of engineers behind us, now there's 120 senior engineers, I had four. So now it's uh, the sky's the limit, and it's pretty significant. The things that we're building now, you know, far supersede, they're, they're far more significant than the things I just showed you. You're a good rep for Thank you. She answered part of my question, you're from Bluffton, mm -hmm. and have you ever had workforce challenges? Yeah, software engineering is, uh, well, Bluffton's not really a hotbed for software engineers. <laughs> and so um, the biggest challenge for me was, uh, was getting engineering talent, and normally, I mean, I just didn't have enough money to pay for senior level folks, so I would, uh, I went to Clemson University and, and several universities around, and then would speak to their computer science departments, speak on behalf of what we were doing, recruit people, get them straight out of college, you know, school them up on what we had already created, um, get them to the point where they were comfortable, and ultimately, um, well, they would get poached away because someone paid them twice as much, like Lisa. Anybody else? I think the time is done. So in the future, uh, for y'all that like bold peanuts, uh, keep your eye peeled because uh, there will be another super successful, technologically advanced bold peanut operation coming in. <laughs>